Okay. Shama, thank you for coming and, um, and, and having this talk. Something you, you had suggested that maybe we sit down and have a talk, but I, I think there's a lot of things that have happened even in the last week where I was like, okay, we need to talk about the things that you're doing. We mm -hmm. need to talk about why, and people need to know. This is what, this is what has come to me. This came to me like a couple of days ago. It was like, I, I, it's very important. So I will, I'll do a little introduction of you if that's okay, just in terms yeah. of like setting the stage. And then yeah. maybe you could tell, you could tell a bit of your story as much as you want to tell to get us caught up to, to where you're at and what we're talking about today. So for people who don't know you, you are now an indelible part of Bitcoin history from the standpoint that anyone, who, well, anyone who is researching the history of Bitcoin, let's say in the first 10 years, they're inevitably going to come to the Bitcoin cash hash war, like the situation with Craig. Craig's a part, Craig's a part of that, right? Anybody who's researching the history, yeah. Craig is like this weird thread that goes, Craig Wright, he's a weird thread that moves through it and is, adds this interesting character to oh, it, right? For sure. For sure, for sure. right? He's, he, he can't be ignored by any historian. And at, people will wonder, well, what happened during the hash war for those who weren't there like we were, right? Mm -hmm. And even for those who were there, it still is a hard thing to understand but for better or worse after the bch bsv split calvin air through one of his shell companies decided that he was going to launch a lawsuit and yeah. within the lawsuit for better or worse in u.s government records now forever is the story at least as yeah. told by calvin of what happened during the hash war and yeah. named in that lawsuit yeah. are just a few people there's just yeah. a few people named and you are one of those people yeah as as one of the key as as the key contingent of abc developers right and yeah. people perhaps somebody could argue and perhaps the historical aspect of how involved was shama at that actual point or not or whatever but regardless yeah the history is going to say here were the developers, right? Amory yeah. Sachet, Shama Chancellor, Jason Cox. Like that's gonna be it. That's yeah. what they're gonna say. These were the these were the three guys. So you're 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 a piece of of your name is written into Bitcoin history forever, right? So I think people should understand that from the beginning as we go in of who it is that we're talking to. Yeah. Right. So for those who don't know you. So I wanted to set that stage, right? Now, now you're working on. Sorry about my screaming children in the background there. Now you're working on a, a project that I think it's been a bit stealth, but I would like to change that. And I think that a lot of people would like to know that something like this exists. I believe we started, we first discussed this in, it's been a year, two years almost? Yeah, when, almost when, two years. Almost two, two well, years. 2019, probably okay, like. Yes, June, four, right? June, something some, like that? Something around there. Yeah, okay. it was kind of like, shuffling around in my head i found another dev to help me and and i started working on it it's not quite like what we talked about but it's right it's close. but that was the germ of the idea and yeah. i think at that point a lot was changing in my own life as well that was sort of when this let's say the spiritual this spiritual path for me that people are starting to see was starting to open up you and i spoke a lot at that time mm -hmm. uh and you have a particular strong spiritual bent so for the past almost two years you and i have you know at times more at times less we've been having a private conversation that's been going on and we've both been building things that's the background that i wanted to give i guess from there so i will i will say what the pro so what is the project and that we're talking about i'll from my standpoint what it is is this it's taking all of the tools that bitcoin gives us and expanding to a larger communication platform that can basically do for more communication, the communication that we need, create the, the platform with the level of tools that give to people the same things that Bitcoin has done for value transfer. So yeah. like, that's like the big picture as I see it. I've always thought that it was a big deal. The fact that you actually built it is pretty amazing and that it's moving forward. So I'm gonna shut up now 
And if you want to fill in like the blanks so people can understand how you got to this point and then talk to us about the point that you're at, and you can fill in from as far back as you want, whatever you think is, is necessary for yeah. us to get there. But I'm just going to shut up because I think the story of this is as important as anything else to understand what, what exactly it is that we're talking about. So I'm going to shut up. now. Okay. I will, uh, I'll give like a, a quick recap from the beginning. So I, you know, I, I found out about Bitcoin when it was first slash dotted. Um, at the time I was, uh, I had just graduated with a degree in computational physics. And I had been studying economics for a long time. I always wondered why could I not print my own money? And so I started figuring out like who prints the money? Like, how is it issued? Like all of these things. And I kind of learned what I would say is monetary monetary modern monetary theory kind of independently just by doing like piecemeal research. Um, so like I, for reference, I feel that's a pretty accurate description of how the current monetary system works in terms of credit money, which differs very much from the Austrian view. Um, and there's some things that maybe the Austrians should learn from researching what monetary, uh, modern monetary theorists have uh, sort of uncovered through researching history, because money always works the same. Um, but I didn't think Bitcoin would scale. I didn't get involved. I thought it was like kind of a, you know, you know, one megabyte blocks, he's going to do that, whatever. Um, and I knew Omri in 2017 already, and he came by San Francisco, and we had a long talk about it, and he convinced me it could scale. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. And I started following what he was doing for the, um, for the fork. Um, uh, in... Uh, like shortly after the fork, Josh Althorpe came over because he also was a friend of mine at the time and uh, was living in San Francisco and asked me to start helping Omri because I am a C++ developer. Um, and so I jumped in and started learning about how everything worked. Um, and one of the first things that uh, Omri had said, because Omri just comments sort of about all the weird mistakes that people are making in the space about how things should be designed. Like one of the first things in Bitcoin was pay to IP, but it, it doesn't work very well because of NAT firewalls, right? And so it was kind of scrapped. But in reality, like in order to pay to script hash or have any kind of confidentiality around your addresses, the sender really needs to be able to generate this information and then give it to you later. And um, rather than doing indexers, so like you just send the person the TXID along with the spend condition and they can use it, but there's no infrastructure for doing that. And so this was something that like was muddling around in my head for a while. And then um, also found out about the original reusable proof of work concept from Hal Finney, which I think sort of has flied under the radar is like a very important piece of, um, of Bitcoin, um, you know, cited in the Bitcoin white paper and Hal Finney actually started helping, you know, develop Bitcoin. Um, but the original purpose of uh, reusable proof of work was to be able to stop spam. It's like an alternative method from like using an AI. Um, and, and just to kind of give some context there, like a lot of us have like moved onto these centralized platforms like Telegram, Facebook, et cetera, um, or even Gmail. And like those big mail providers have kind of consolidated um, primarily because by having access to all of this email data, they can more, uh, more efficiently detect spam and get rid of it. And then platforms like Telegram and whatnot, they're all, they all, have, they're all centralized so they can ban people that spam. Uh, and they're also attached to some kind of valuable digital resource, like a phone number or an email. And so, um, Ultimately, we lose our privacy because somebody can go through all their metadata on like all these other platforms. And unless you're being particularly careful about using a different email for each different thing and, and whatnot, people can kind of consolidate this and have a, a global picture of everything you've been doing online on all these centralized platforms. And that's something that's bothered me for a long time. Um, uh, my bet on it is like if you're a politician, right? Um, you don't like it would be very easy to censor a po politician on all these platforms, and we actually sort of see this happening first, like 
Uh, well, Donald Trump, Donald Trump yeah. was, I mean, it's a prime it, example. It, they censored the as big as they come, yeah. right? The, the leader of the free world was censored on all the platforms. Exactly. And so this is a big, big problem for me. I mean, um, I don't think that people should be censorable, right? And, and Bitcoin offers this cool platform where it's not censorable. And in order to keep spam off, it uses fees, right? You have to pay the miners some, some, uh, some Bitcoins in order to use it. But if you really think about it, Bitcoin is reusable proof of work. But instead of using the original hashes, which was what uh, Hal Finney was envisioning with like some kind of idea, I, you know, uh, it couldn't exist in reality, but in his like proposal, there would be this magical server that would like take a hash and then like issue it to a new person and whatnot. But Bitcoin, you essentially, you get, you do some proof of work and you get issued some numbers on a ledger um, and then those can be moved around over time. And so that proof of work is essentially like kept around and had a real world cost to it. So what if you could attach Bitcoins to emails, for example, right? And actually put a cost on every email um, that would basically allow you to uh, not need all of these like very centralized platforms anymore. And you wouldn't even need uh, a way to read the emails, right? Because you, all you need to know is that there's value attached to that message, but it has an interesting side effect now in that you're like, sending real value when you send somebody a message. Um, and just uh, another bit of context for reasonable proof of work is that if somebody's spamming, right, a lot of people aren't going to reply. And so that costs a spammer a lot of money. But like if Vin and I are emailing back and forth, I could send him 10 bucks. It would go to the top of his inbox. And if he replied, you know, he assuming he likes me, he would send me the 10 bucks back, or maybe he'd send me a, a dollar because he gets a lot of emails and that's how he's making his money is just sort of like being an information broker. I mean, that would be a possibility in this system. Um, but hypothetically, if it's just two peers communicating, uh, the money would just go back and forth and it doesn't really cost us anything. You just have some value locked up in the conversation. This has a really interesting side effect is because it, it having real money attached to communication also, uh, or not, you know, having some value attached to the communication uh, can focus attention, right? Like if you have a thousand emails, you're going to look at the ones that are like, this dude sent me a hundred dollars, but also like people are going to be less hesitant to send emails that are useless. Right? And so it, it, like one of the conversations right now is how all these AIs are prioritizing search results and, and your Twitter feed and whatnot from centralized platforms and so they can tweak these ais to potentially do things that and uh, sensor information and whatnot <laughs> but uh, uh, by introducing a system like reusable proof of work where you uh, but using bitcoin itself you have the ability to um you know put your money where your mouth is and people can see that and respond if they choose to and so it's like a little you know it's like a, a signal to other people that this is important information that I want to put out there and nobody can censor me. And that's now, the original, that's the original, like, if, if we go all the way back, this is the original use case for proof of work. Like this is the canonical, yeah. that's what people should understand that the proof of work technology, the canonical application is to, to mitigate spam or a way to prioritize messages. So email really. Yep. Right, so Cynthia Cynthia Dwork and Moni now are their initial paper. I, I believe it's pricing via processing. It's called. That's exactly what they're talking about. So just I just wanted to throw that in there so people understand that like what you're saying is not. This is actually not. It's not novel. It's not well. It's it's not. It's more important actually. I think it, it's more important that you are going back to the source. That as of yet, no one has actually used proof of work for its stated purpose which was the reason that they were like oh this is the perfect solution so i've always i found that interesting when you when we first started having these conversations that i was like ooh shama's going to the source like he's going all the way back and almost like starting over so i've mm -hmm. always found that very interesting i'm sorry to interrupt you but i just wanted to make sure that that was understood in this con that people understood that context great yeah i appreciate it i get kind of lost in uh when i'm talking and i i I'm a nonlinear thinker, so I tend to not to 
present ideas. No, it's perfect. It's, it's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. Everything so far, the story is totally coherent. It's totally coherent. So I wanted to build this uh, system. And, you know, we were talking in, in, uh, in June of 2019. Um, I wasn't doing anything at that time. I wasn't working on Bitcoin ABC anymore. And so I wanted, I wanted to still be engaged and involved. And I thought, you know, this idea of attaching value to messages and this other issue of like wallets not being able to communicate. I thought about uh, trying to attach value right to emails, but the uh, SMTP protocol in the mail uh, format is all ASCII. It's very unwieldy to deal with. And there's also this still this problem of like, how do I trustlessly find a person's Bitcoin address and like do all of these things? So I started just designing a system from scratch. Um, I thought, why bother having an email address when I can just use a person's Bitcoin address both to send them uh, the message and to send them the Bitcoins. And I can also use that to encrypt the message. And I just sort of like get all of that uh, in one nice package. And so um, I started building a key server, uh, as I call it, which is essentially like, um, you know, the GPG key servers. Um, you, um, but it works as sort of a, just a global key value store attached to a a Bitcoin uh, public key. And then you can look up a person's uh, address on there, get their public key and get other metadata. And the other metadata then is a, a way to send a message to a relay server. So something equivalent to an SMTP server. So instead of just normal email where there's like user at wherever the SMTP server is, now there's this extra layer where you can essentially look up a phone number from a... Uh, a Bitcoin address and like get all the other metadata you need. And then the relay server just stores these messages for people and, and verifies that there's actually value attached to the message. So we, I call it a stamp transaction. Um, and then there's some interesting cryptography to make sure that like transactions are, aren't reused to different messages and whatnot. Um, and by having this new protocol, it introduces a lot of other uh, interesting things you can do, although I haven't implemented them, is like you could pay to script hash, send that to somebody along with the spend conditions, and they wouldn't have to actually like, you know, normally they would have, you'd have to transmit that out of bound, like here's the spend script, or they would have to give it to you, something along those lines, whereas now you can just, you could do that directly. And so there's a lot of interesting use cases when wallets can start talking to one another, like online multi-signature schemes for like Schnorr signatures and stuff are all, all begin to be possible when people's wallets can talk uh, directly to one another. And you don't have to like copy a base 64 uh, message from Electron Cash over Telegram and like do these uh, you know, so complicated operations. The efficiency of doing it just becomes much higher. So this is like, this is really important. So because I'm sure that there's going to be some people who are like, what did he just say? Like if the people who are in the people who are in Bitcoin mystery school that I do will be like, ah, I know what he just said. Right. But for, so I, I think it's, it's actually pretty important what you just said. I, if I can like translate it at a pretty high level, because this is a, this is a, a challenge that I have been having to overcome in my own projects that I've been doing recently. Right. And that yeah. many, many people have who have been exploring sort of the, the higher level script stuff. Uh, and collaborative transactions and things like that, doing escrow and these type of things. So basically, so that people understand, um, in order to spend this pay to script hash, as he's saying, which is a more complex contract in Bitcoin, there's there's an additional, basically the the raw actual instructions of the script that the person spending has to know, but that they can't tell just from the address in the same way that they can with the standard uh, pay to public key hash. They know what all those pieces are because they're standard, right? So basically what your, what your system allows is it allows this as a protocol, it allows wallets to not only communicate the types of messages that are like, hey, Shama, what's going on, right? So that a wallet could communicate that message. It could also communicate the types of messages that only the wallet needs to see itself, to Correct. spend these much, to do much more complex things. So to have mm -hmm. building transactions back and forth with these wallets communicating to each other behind the scenes, 
Yeah. In the same way that you and I might communicate to each other in the thing that we see. So just yeah. so that people understand, it's like this is a protocol for to do so many more complex things that right now just simply cannot be done in, a, in an automated way. Right. Yeah. So just for people to understand that it's like it the scope, it's it's hard to explain just how massive of scope this is in terms of I mean, the easiest thing is multisig. Yeah. Right. That's that's by far the easiest thing is that it's like it would enable you to do multi-signature wallets between people with, I mean, ease. Me, me and you and five other people yeah. are like, hey, let's all let's all do this uh, multi-sig together, multi-signature to where it's like four out of five of us have to sign in order to spend it. And we could do yeah. it in a heartbeat yeah. with this protocol. So like uh, BitPay, for example, their wallet, and I think Bitcoin.com also has this, although I'm not a big wallet connoisseur because I'm just sort of focused on my own um, and what I want. Um, there are all these centralized platforms. So you have, everybody has to be using their wallet. If for whatever reason uh, they go down or you're censored from it, now you can't access your multi-sig wallet without a whole bunch of recovery operations in order to, to make that function. Um, and so I don't want to do that, right? And so it, in this system, because it's using uh, a, essentially reusable proof of work, but it's attaching value, you know, you can decentralize all these servers and you can create an open protocol where nobody needs to moderate it anymore. So it's totally unmoderated and that makes it uncensorable. If uh, now you could get censored from one relay server, but because of that key server network that's shared everything, you just move where you receive messages, no big deal. And so this is, uh, you know, my main motivation for this. But over the last, you know, two years of working on this, I, I've come to some other sort of really interesting conclusions about uh, about how it's useful from a social perspective. Um, as, like I said before, there's the attention, right? You're now you're 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 actually valuing information using uh, cryptocurrency which is very interesting because you can now understand how important information is in like a one number. Right? And you have uh, ability to do uh, analysis on that. So let, wait, so let's dig in. Let's dig into this because like, I think it's important for people to understand and it'll be helpful for me too to flesh this idea out because this is something yeah. that, you know, I've been talking a, a lot about I, I touch on it briefly in my new book, this idea of the, the value of certain information and the difficulty we have, and although we know we value it. So for instance, people value attention. They value the likes and the retweets and the, clearly they do. People will kill themselves if they don't get enough likes and retweets and views and engagement, right? Like it literally will happen. Yeah. And it has happened, you know, and, yeah. and it's getting more, more to that case. Let's talk about the how, how corruption when we've got these centralized platforms we have people who could control where the attention is focused how that how society is altered by a model where it's the free market of attention basically is what we start talking about yeah. so like talk to me about your insights into that because i think it's like so much deeper than anybody else is thinking but it's almost like you can't even think that far until you've played around with something like what you've built, if that makes sense. Like you have to actually ha hold it in your hand to experience it. So talk to me about yeah. the insights that have come. Well, so I, I, um, I, I did a test earlier this year where I put it on the Bitcoin ABC mainnet and I was giving away money. And uh, you know, I got a lot of users relatively quickly. This is sort of the PayPal model of doing things, but um, I, I try to by doing that, the thing that I noticed is that people they only have 24 hours in a day, right? So if I'm paying them to use my platform instead of Facebook or instead of Twitter, then I'm effectively able to remove the influence that Facebook and Twitter have on those people for that period of time. Um, 
by pulling their attention with real value. Facebook and Twitter get your attention with notifications and likes and whatnot because your friends are there. And then they sell you to advertisers and political uh, people that want to you know, politically manipulate the masses. Um, and I don't like how cheap it is for them to do that. <laughs> It is relatively inexpensive once they have these centralized platforms from their perspective. But if they had to actually pay us all to see these like interleaved messages that they're sending along, you know, these supplemental messages along with us communicating with one another, um, they wouldn't be able to keep that up for very long. Um, and so that was one of the, the big insights that I had by, uh, you know, playing around with it. Um, I and mean, there's, really, there's go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's really important for, for me, not just from a perspective of, uh, of like stopping spam. I need people to use the platform in order to get them into the, the ecosystem uh, where this is valuable. If it's just me, it's not very helpful. Um, but I also really hate the subversive influences that are happening on these platforms and the, and the censorship. Um, there's various types of censorship. There's soft censorship and hard censorship going on. Soft censorship, they just don't show you things from uh, certain people as often. Um, but this has a the outsized impact that this would have on society if people were using it. They're no longer focusing their attention on, you know, as I as I call it, like the the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? They're like, they're not turning to salt anymore, which is funny because that's actually kind of like we talk about people being salty, right? Um, uh, they, they get all, you know, pissed off on Twitter, right. salty right. You're and salty, whatever. Yeah. yeah, but they're look, they're looking at Sodom and Gomorrah fall and they're right. turning to salt. And I think that's, you know, it, I wonder if that's sort of just the symbolic story around that mm -hmm. actual phenomenon that happened. Um, mm -hmm. uh, cause I don't, I don't necessarily believe that all of these stories are, are like fully literal. There's probably like some kernel to it and then mm -hmm. it's transformed into a way where it would interest children and be retold over time. Right. But it's not, it's maybe not literal, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. That's, that's like a difficult I think that when people are able to grasp that concept, that's when everything unlocks. That it's like, yeah. even even if it's, yeah, because even literally, is it true? Like this is, uh, again, this is something I talk about in, in my book that it's like, you know, the person sitting in the orchestra section in the best seat watching a play on stage is watching a different play than the person sitting in like obstructed view in the balcony. And their mm -hmm. description of what just happened is going to be different between the two of them, right? Even if it's literal. But yeah. the story, what's underneath and what they tell of like, I say, well, whoa, what, what went on? And they tell the story that they saw. And they basically both saw the same story. And if we yeah. combine enough of those stories, we get a good idea of like, oh, that's what happened on stage, you know? Yeah. And that's, uh, it's very important. I wanted to, to, talk about this a little bit more about you know you said the cheapness of that they sell you they sell your attention to these corporate interests or what whoever yeah for for really cheap and this has become this aspect of how cheap it is has become really obvious to me as of late because I think at this point, there's a what's approaching maybe like a critical mass in my own life between, let's say, my newsletter, my books, uh, and my classes, to where the people who are interested in one tend to want all of them. And when new people come on, they tend to want all of them. And so I spend most of my time talking to, like within Telegram, private Telegram groups and whatnot, most of the time that I spend is talking to people who have already basically purchased my things and it helped to keep me and my family alive, right? And, mm -hmm. and operating and enable me to continue to produce things. And 
the amount that I'm willing to spend, I'm willing to spend a considerable amount for those people's attention. Like to me, those are valuable people where I'm, and I'm willing to just give to a lot of them too, of my own attention. Like if somebody from one of these groups reaches out to me and asks me for my time, yeah. it's not, I know, I know already that, the, oh, you've already given of yourself to me. Yeah. So it's like, you've already done the proof of work. So now the, the reciprocity is like, well, of course I will do that. Of course I will take the time to answer this question. Of course I will, you know, patiently walk you through whatever you need. Like I'm here for you, mm -hmm. you know, and the incentive is so different in terms of my feeling of responsibility toward those individuals. And in mm. terms of my feeling of responsibility about what my message is towards those individuals, because we're in a reciprocal value relationship. And I feel like we know this, right? Like we, this is how we operate. This is such a huge part of my new book too, right? Which is why yeah. I wanted to have this conversation. Like yeah. we know that these reciprocal relationships is what makes civilization. It's what makes society. The better your reciprocity is, the better and more peaceful your society is. And I just feel like, once again, Bitcoin is one of these, it's one of these amazing things. It's, it's what's come to me is that it's like, you, you've taken a next step and you've even further embodied a platform that allows us to like physically experience this in a way yeah. that can be quantified to where yeah. we're like, yeah, the amount that's been exchanged between us is actually this amount. Yes. And the more that's exchanged, the higher in the, it's like, yeah, boom, you know, it's, it's such, it's my, like you say, like on a societal level, it's just like, next level to see how reality actually operates and what we are as humans. I think it's, yeah, talk to that a little bit. And, and well, and one of the things that I find interesting, you know, is that uh, being a developer as I am, I've interacted with a number of people who clearly, hmm, I won't say that they're all trolls, but a number of them just don't care enough to actually go through a discussion to get a question answered but they're willing to ask it, right? They don't care about the answer, but they are willing to ask it sort of just to like amuse themselves. But when you actually make that first message cost some money, are they going to bother me, right? I already know that there's some, you know, re reciprocal exchange, right? Because they have to make a actual, a sacrifice, right? They have to sacrifice some money and risk that I just take it. And so like, is a troll going to, tell me, you know, is he going to message me on stamp and say like some bad thing about me? Is it that important? Okay, well, maybe I need to know it then if it's that important that they're going to send me some money with an insult um, or money with their question they don't care about getting the answer to. Um, yeah, because it doesn't, I, I, that's, and that's yet another thing. We've got an environment now on these centralized platforms where, you know, the anonymous troll, where's, where's the commitment? Where's the risk? And it's exactly like spam. It's like, there's no risk because it costs you nothing. It costs you mm -hmm. no social value. You know, I'm on an island of 55,000 people and people are surprised. There's maybe 50,000 here. There's 55,000 in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. but there's like no, no crime, but it's amazing the degree to which people who even like myself are pretty disagreeable go out of our way. And we talk about it constantly like, uh, it just wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth ruining my reputation on it because it's a small place. Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's not yeah. like in a big city where you're, you could just be like, you know, somebody's on the road and, and like, you're like, fuck you, whatever you can do that because chances are, you're never going to see them again. If you yeah. do that here, it's only 55 that you will see them again. Yes. You yeah. will like, you might see them tomorrow. And you yeah. might see them every day. And so it's like, that's you, that's in the front of your mind. And even if you've never lived in a place like that, the second you get here, your instinct kicks into that. And so making someone have to literally risk to, to literally risk value in order to um, troll, in order to, in order to do something negative towards another person. Yeah. Also, what it indicates is 
anybody who people are behaving negatively toward and they're willing to put up that risk when you have a lot of people, that's probably a bad person. Yeah. Right. The market you're pay, probably you're says paying them for it, right? Yes. You're paying them to be a bad person. So then you don't even want to say it, right? Right. <laughs> right. So you're like, what, what, who's this Logan guy on YouTube? I can't remember. Logan Paul. Name. Logan yeah, Paul. Yeah. like, would you, <laughs> would you pay to say that he's an idiot? Like, you're just like encouraging him uh, if you're pay, having to pay to do it. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting and something that, well, this was even, you know, we were, we were sort of on the same side. I think, I don't know for you, but for, I had a conversation with some BSV people yesterday. Daniel Kraywitz invited me on his little live stream and he had some of their BSV nincompoops on there. And they were like, ah, what's this with you? And how's things with the Mari coin and all of this? And I was like, look, man, um, much to the chagrin of many of the ABC fans, I have not as of yet built anything on ABC, yeah. right? Like the things that I'm building are compatible with ABC, but am I running them on ABC at the moment? No, I still have some things, you know, there's some things going on. Work. Right, right, whatever. So, but, but when the, you know, ABC, BCH split was happening, you and I both, both lined up on the side of ABC from a standpoint of principle. And mm -hmm. part of the principle for me was all of these people that I called Bitsheviks, and, and it makes sense in this context, right? Of laying on Bolsheviks, communists, whatever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is because there was no cost to them talking shit, slandering, doing joint statements where they say what a terrible person Omri is, spreading lies about him, spreading lies about me, spreading lies about you right? There was no risk or cost to them to do that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the asymmetry, it's so easy in a situation like that to squelch the voices of otherwise righteous people, because yeah, really you have to be so strong. And I know you are, and I am, but you have to be so strong willed to remain righteous in the face of a whole bunch of wicked people who it cost them nothing to civil attack you, to spam you, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be in a position where your reputation doesn't matter. My financial well-being does not depend on Bitcoin Cash. You saw that everyone whose financial well-being depended on Bitcoin Cash fell in line. And that's just social incentives. I don't let I never let myself uh, be in a position where my well-being depends on somebody who I'm not sure whether they'll ask me to do something I agree with or not. It's just something, you know, because if I'm in that situation, I'll have to cave, right? And so it's just something that I don't let myself do to begin with. Um, and so at least that, that, it allows me to be free. And, and, okay, so I think that's a good jumping off point for another thing that I think uh, unites us. And that was actually a conversation that has been coming up over the last couple of days. And I think there's actually even a, a podcast that's probably about to be released that I did with these four guys called Paul, to, three guys, Paul to the wall, Paul's to the wall, um, where they were asking about Christianity. And even the conversation came up this morning with some guys at morning prayer about this idea of the sovereign. And yeah. what I said to them is like, and, and I, and it would be interesting to, to talk about this from a spiritual standpoint, because I feel like um, I feel like Christians, maybe maybe Muslims to a degree on this as well, but certainly Christians are who 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 really understand in their heart like what what this means of Christ as King and Christ as Sovereign. That it seems to me that that's the only means to being in the position that you said to where your your earthly reputation because you're answering to something higher it seems like that's what it is right you're answering you have to answer to something higher whether that's a principle a principle would get you through on the abc thing you know what mm -hmm. i mean a principle yeah yeah um but when we get to these higher sorts of things when there's actual physical pain being inflicted on somebody or threats against their children or threats against their you know whatever yeah. 
it's got to go much higher than a principal. Most people who it's just about principal, they're going to fold in that situation to where yeah. it's got to go to, I answer to something higher. So I don't care. Yeah. You, you don't, I, what, what I fear this. And it's really, it's almost like a fear. Mm -hmm. So for me, I truly do fear going against my principles mm -hmm. and well, in some ways, because like you say, like my income and my livelihood and my reputation is based around an exposition of a set of principles, right? I've yeah. written these books. Yep. I give these talks. I, you know, people, whoever's following me, whoever wants to talk to me, whoever wants to be involved with me. Yeah. It's because of these, these principles that I have expounded. The second that I don't live by those principles anymore, I, I risk destroying my and everything that I've built. Yeah. Right? I mean, it rests this all the time. These. Yeah. Somebody's in some high position. They can't, you know, they're making a lot of money and then and then they can't get a job doing anything but delivering pizza or something afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so like, so, so you and I talk about spiritual matters often. If you're, I mean, if you're willing, I think it would be interesting. And I would like to sure. hear because I don't think they're disconnected. The sort of your spiritual outlook on what is the right thing, righteous thing to do. Right. And yeah. is not disconnected from how you manifested in the world. So as we move forward, we're in this interesting time. And a lot of people have been reaching out to me. And I think they're interested in me talking about these issues. And you are, have, have a deep understanding of a lot of these issues. And you and I talk about them. With where we're at, you're clearly building tools to help a remnant of people to move through this time right? You're way out ahead of when the flood is coming. You're, you're one of the people building an art. You want to talk about how your experience and how your connection with, with your sovereign at a spiritual level is affecting like your behavior in this as, as you move forward? Sure. Yeah. I, um, for some context, I was raised in like a very fundamentalist, uh, literalist Christian cult. And then, I, you know, uh, being the, the precocious child I was, I asked lots of questions that I could never get answers to. Um, I ultimately wanted, I, I wanted to try to find God. And so I got a degree in physics and they told me I was on, in the wrong, uh, wrong discipline many times. Um, which I don't think is true in retrospect, but um, I think it was the right degree for me to get. Um, but there's a lot, there's just a lot of things that these people say that are sort of either, you know, fundamentalist Protestants or, or you know, Jehovah's Witness or something like that, where they take these stories to be very literal rather than like illustrative of a truth. Um, and some of the things, you know, did happen or happened in part, but um, I, there's a lot of things where I just don't know what's true. I wasn't there. Um, but there's always a, 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 a metaphorical corollary. Um, and so, I've spent a ton of time, I, I took a sociology class in college and I took some psychology classes and I found them to be extremely interesting. And I've researched tons of stuff on um, in-group, out-group uh, interactions and uh, how people, you know, thinking errors and like all this stuff. It's been very beneficial to me. But then recently I realized that, um, well, for one, I, I always just try to do what I think is right. And a lot of what I um, think is right is from me, you know, exiting this Christian cult and then trying to sort through stuff and be like, is this right? Is this really ethical? Is this really ethical? Like, I didn't take it all with me, but I did try to keep uh, the things that were useful and the things that were good uh, when I left. And so I, I just continued to practice what made sense to me. But recently, I... Um, uh, I've realized that there's a number of concepts through listening to Jordan Peterson and some other uh, individuals and then my own knowledge of 
psychology and sociology that a lot of these spiritual concepts are simplified explanations for very complicated and very real processes that you couldn't explain to most people in a reasonable amount of time. And in fact, in many cases, we use these, what I would have learned are concrete entities to explain real phenomena even, like people talk about when they're an alcoholic having a demon, right? But we know that there's not like a spiritual entity inhabiting them. There's a genetic defect that causes them to experience alcohol different than other people. And so they just need to not drink it. Like that's one, one example. Um, but like karma in, in uh, other religions, that's, um, you know, that's very real. And it's expressed in Christianity by saying that, you know, the measure with which you judge by, so too you will be judged. Um, not, only, um, not only because people will reflect that back to you, but you'll end up judging yourself because that's the, the, the measure you're using, right? So whenever you evaluate yourself, you're going to be using this, how you judge. And so Jesus says, like, I don't judge, but if I do judge, I judge justly, right? And by not judging other people, you're free not to judge yourself anymore. And you can get rid of your feelings of, of like inadequacy. And so there's lots of these concepts that are given in, you know, religious terminology, but they're very real things that are discussed in, in when you read about, you know, CBT and like these other, uh, uh, um, like, uh, psychology treatment frameworks. Um, but the perspective is different. Sociology and psychology, they go and, and um, anthropology, they like, they're looking at a subject, right? And they're like taking notes and they're observing its behavior. But religion is expressed from your internal world out, right? And it's very hard for someone to to go and like just read a psychology textbook or a sociology textbook and change their behavior in a way that would help them, right? In fact, we all know these people that are like, I'm gonna get a degree in psychology because I'm all messed up and I wanna understand myself, right? And it does them absolutely no good. <laughs> they, have, they still have no idea what's wrong with them because they still don't have a mirror. Well, it's, it's Hume's works. guillotine in a way, isn't it? Like you can't derive an ought from an is. So they're looking for the ought, like what ought I to do to feel better, to change my life and all of this. But instead, what this academic pursuit gives them is the is. It just like lists off all the, and it's like, but what do I do with that? Like, how do I, what, I don't yeah. know what to do, you know? Yeah, you feel, if you feel inadequate, what you should do is stop judging other people and change your measuring stick, right? And this is like the religious perspective. And, and I found all of this stuff to be true. I've, and I've, I found it very, very interesting going back through all of this stuff I've learned and, and try to connect it with actually all the science that I've learned. And, and there's a huge lineup in all of these texts and it's why people have kept them around for so long. Um, the, yeah, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, and, and it's, it, it is right now, I think Jordan Peterson, it's definitely the forerunner, right? So that's the one yeah. of the names of John the Baptist. I think he is definitely the pattern of the forerunner because yeah. so many people, it's like wh whenever I see somebody who's like on a path of illumination now, that name, Jordan, it, they always say, there's a, a point, they're always like Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson, Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson. And I, I just feel like he opened up, but particularly his biblical lectures, right? I feel yeah. like, he he opened up the space that it was like oh we can look at these as tools mm -hmm. like there's we can actually that's okay like it's not yeah. it's not oh i can be a complete materialist and i think that even for complete materialists who are like okay there's some truth in there and it describes this but i think where you're right is and where i've where i've come to is while I, I do see, and I have seen, and I think I came into this 
very much in the same way, right? I think a lot of people race in the church fell away because it's like, what the hell is this for whatever reasons depend, you know, levels of trauma, right? I, I would say my levels of trauma regarding this are probably a lot less than yours, having come from the experience that you came from, right? Um, but who come back and are like, okay, I'll approach it completely materialistically. And then really what you do come to is you're like, ah, yeah, but this is like shorthand in a way. To where yeah, I don't have it's to, an abstraction. I, yeah, I don't have to keep all of this knowledge. I don't have to have all of this knowledge. I can just approach it in this. It's a meme, right? Yeah. Like I can. It's it's so much easier. I don't have to explain all the things. I just do a Wojak meme, and you mm -hmm. get it immediately. You know exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to explain some of these things. It's like an hour and a half later. If somebody will even give me the time, right? But it's like, you know, these like parables and stuff. Jesus was a memer, right? Like that's, but his memes are set in the context yes. of like goat herders and, and <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, so they're just not very persuasive anymore. Like uh, it, it, to, to a lot of people, cause they don't get them. Um, and, and, and also I, I think a lot of these things are observational. I think that when people wrote, they didn't necessarily like, oh, God told me, or God said this. Right. It's also shorthand. Yeah. But what I think they meant in many cases is like, well, I'm an old dude and I watched a lot of people do stupid stuff and die. And they, all of them had this particular thing in common. Therefore, mm -hmm. God says, don't fornicate with a bunch of people or you're going to die of syphilis. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't know that it's syphilis since so they omit the why. Right. Right. And a lot of people right. think that, oh, there's no law. There's no whys in the Bible. There's just don't do this stuff. Therefore, uh, I don't believe in God. Therefore, it's stupid uh, and I'm not going to do it. I mean, just sort of throw it all out. And then they have severe consequences in their life. I've seen it in a, a huge, I have a ton of friends that are Jehovah's Witnesses and they just sort of like did the opposite of everything and said, right? And their life is totally messed up. They probably, they, in many cases, they don't even realize that it's their own doing. Um, and it's just a rebelliousness against what I would say is just reality. Right. Right. If you become judgmental, then like you suffer the consequences from doing that. And it's not like a lot of like that one in particular, people think like, oh, if I judge the people that when I die, God is the one that's going to judge me. Eh, so maybe that's not really kind of that's not really what it says. It's right. it's a it's a truism. Right. Right. All of these things are expressed as truisms, which if they're truisms, it means that it's not up to God. Right. God is just, it, that's just how it is, that's right? How it, that's just the structure of reality, the eternal structure of reality. Correct. Yeah. And these, these are the trade-offs that essentially um, God made in order to create the world. Like, because he wanted humans to have two legs and two arms and two right. eyes and whatnot, right. there's consequences for everyone because of that. Right. In terms of, like, these other limitations, like we... You know, there are disease because, uh, he, you know, he needed to create cells and, and right, right. all things that are weak so that evolution can carries on and, and people don't become horribly disfigured. You know, yeah, it's the, it's the like, fabric, the fabric of reality and the rules. And I think that this is from a standpoint of a physicist, you, uh, you, you know, getting into physics and it's something, uh, again, it's like, this is the parallel that this is a big parallel that I draw in my book is that, yeah, it's when we talk about God, the Christian God writ large. Yeah. Like it is the eternal and unchanging laws of the universe that we are operating within. And those laws exist. Now yes. we can't, we can't ever fully know the fullest extent of those laws. Correct. But over time and through a tradition, we can, start to get closer as to like, well, if you do this, pretty good chance this is, now not always, Correct. right? Because that's part of the rules too. But it's like pretty good chance. And if you continually do it, almost guaranteed. Correct. Like the more you times- you yes. evil, right? <laughs> Yes, yes. And like, but, oh, I'm going to get good at this bad thing. Yes, yes. Then, then, it will, then it will come back on you. And it's like, to me- and I think anybody who spends time thinking about it, that's so very true. Yeah. It's just, it's just on its face. It's true. Even at yeah. the most materialist level, it's true. 
And that, but then you have to ask, well, you know, there's a, there's a layer of subtlety. There's so many things for us to decide. And we believe that things ch are changing. Oh, we're in a world like we've never seen before. Are we? Like, we just got laid low by a plague. But now we really see like, well, was it the plague that did it? Like, I think that this is a real revel. This is why people have had a real revelation that it may have been even in the past that it's like, no, it wasn't the plague that destroyed them. It was that the plague revealed all of the places that they had been willfully blind, as Jordan Peterson has said, right? It's yeah. revealed all of the things. So it's like we have typhoons here. We were just talking about this yesterday, right? We were just talking about this yesterday to where uh, I'm looking at there's a, a power plant on this island. Yeah. And the guy was telling me, he was like, look, in 1987, there was a big typhoon. And the power plant that they had, like, basically, like, blew up. And he said, so they shipped from, like, Hitachi or something. There was a leftover giant power plant in Japan. And they shipped it here in 1987, just when they joined with the U.S. And he was like, it was supposed to be temporary. It's still, <laughs> it's still there, okay? Yeah. We're in Typhoon Alley. He was like, back in, he said, maybe back in 2004 or something like that. He said the entire island's power went was out for two weeks because a part broke from this. And it's an old World War II era. They couldn't find the part. They had to machine it, all of this. And it's like, bro, they left it running. And so he was like, look, one of these typhoons, it didn't happen in 2018. We had a super typhoon. He's like, look, one of these typhoons is going to destroy that thing. And what it does is, well, is it the typhoon that is the crisis? No, it's the cor it's corruption of the people being willfully blind. And then you start, yeah, then you start to see, well, ah, you know, having the king has to go to the temple and be reprimanded by the priests and, you know, do his, his repentance and be, you know, under the feel the watchful eye of God, he replaces the power plant. That's the king who replaces the power plant, who's mm -hmm. like, it's a high priority. We got to get it replaced. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the king who's lounging back and eating grapes and all, oh, it's all, it's fine, right? And this is just true, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. just true. And so it's like, we have this plague. It's not COVID. Yeah. It's not COVID that's doing all of this. It's a mental illness. Exactly. That we've let into the, we let it into our culture. We yes. let it in. Right. And so anything will take us down. Anything. Yes. And I feel like that's the broader context in which, so you're working on this project, but I feel like there's a, a, a greater, what I would hope people would walk away with is like a greater idea of how we solve this. Yes. And the fact that you have, you went, so Cynthia Dwork and Moni Nahr write their, their paper in 92, I believe. Pricing via processing. I believe it's 92. I haven't read that one. I only read his website, but yeah. It's interesting, man. So it's like, it's, but it's just straightforward. Like you really get it, right? And Adam Back, it's almost the same as Hashcash, right? So it's almost the mm -hmm. exact same, right? But so here we are in 1992 and they're like, this is the application. You think, how is the landscape of everything different if this is adopted as the means for controlling spam in 1992, as opposed to Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail centralizing it? Like, how does yeah. it change? We don't have Facebook. Yeah. We don't have Twitter. We have this. Well... There's a, there's a couple of things like all the other ideas that are necessary didn't happen in 92. There's a lot of stuff coming together that only really happened in, you know, 2017. And I'm still like figuring stuff out in, uh, about how the incentive structure of it works. I'm like studying it and thinking about it still. Um, you know, uh, for one, we wouldn't be having all these arguments on Twitter. Like people's attention would not be focused on the wrong things. There's this good article the other other day um, about uh, 
how Google's algorithms are essentially what's happening is that Facebook, Google, Twitter, they have these AIs that promote content and they're based around optimizing uh, how much of your attention they can sell to other people. But this is actually really bad, right? Because it, it, it becomes addicting for people and it sucks them into uh, looking at uh, essentially negative content, anything that'll get you spun up. Um, and then it also takes you away from the other important details of your life. Right. If you're looking at your phone, you're not looking at your kids. Um, and so you really have to like be a disciplined individual in order to uh, make that separation. And so um, I think that, that none of this stuff would have happened. I think that the reason why a lot of this stuff is seeping in is because of uh, the way in which culture has ended up being manipulated by um, particularly by the Bay Area. I think that California's culture is totally damaged. Uh, the reason why, like, there's a huge amount of narrative around how social structures work coming out of critical theory and critical race theory that are just wrong. If you study sociology, the things they say are false. They don't line up with reality. And because they have uh, they have decided that uh, there is a problem, but without looking at like sociology and how that causes those problems, they've decided that there are solutions that are going to solve X, Y, Z problem, and they're going to implement them at all costs. But in reality, what they're doing is they're exacerbating the problem that they're trying to fix because they don't know, like, they, didn't, they weren't being pragmatic, right? They didn't start from where they wanted to get and back go backwards to like where they are and then carry out those steps to fix society. Well, and the incentive, the incentive is also, it's funny, like right before this conversation, the thought that came to me was about the lamb, the lamb and the shepherd. So I did a, 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 a prayer earlier today yeah. uh, with the, with the Orthodox brother and um, why, why Christ is the lamb and the shepherd. And I realized that it's exactly the incentive section that Satoshi wrote, because if, if the, if you are the lamb and the shepherd, then you have, if you let the wolf in, you die. Yeah. If you sleep, if you're the lamb and the shepherd and you fall asleep as the shepherd, you're eat, you're dead. Yeah right? Because you're the lamb also. Yeah. Yes. And that is the incentive section. That is the incentive section yeah. of Bitcoin. That yeah. the reason you don't, if you've got 51% of the hash power, the reason that you're incentivized to not reduce the, the, the value of the network and the coins that you have is because you're getting more coins than anyone else. You're the lamb and you're the shepherd. Yeah. This and is they it. don't so, they don't have that, but they don't the, these critical theory people don't have that incentive. They don't suffer from from they don't think they things. suffer. Right. They okay. will. They will right. suffer. Right. They don't suffer immediately though. Correct. It's saying. too far out. It's too far. But this out. is also in the context of you got to remember that like we're living in a credit money system where debt is forced upon us through the like whenever money is issued. There's also debt enter, entered into the economy, and so everybody's time preferences are all messed up. Right. Everybody's like looking at the immediate future because there's all of these other individuals that are like cracking the whip in order to pay debts. And so that's the, like another like that. I was my actual argument is that most of these problems are caused by that. Right. That well, and, are, and isn't are, it interesting that uh, that being a debtor and a creditor are both high sins in most certainly Western religions. Right. Yeah. Lending lending at interest is a absolute forbidden activity interesting again like whoa even in christianity but people ignore. even in christian especially in christianity yeah tons of christians do it though they don't really think about it but um so that i mean 
that culture is the context of where all these companies operate and all their employees naturally are that way. It's not that there's some conspiracy there. It's just, that's how they are. That's the episteme they live in is that this is how we're going to fix these problems. And so they use, they use their employer's power to enact their ideology. And it is a religion. It's absolutely a religion. You come here, you look around, you try to talk to these people, their belief system is cultural and it is a cult. Um, and there's a ton of people like me here where they've come here to work and they can't have a discussion about it because the, 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 there's a lot of people that have just bought into these ideologies and they get like, as soon as they experience any intellectual discomfort, discomfort causing them to have some kind of um, dissonance, they just blow up on you. Um, you have to be very careful how you approach asking them questions and whatnot, but usually it's, it's not worth the time and worth the bother. Um, I think one interesting thing is that there is a, all, there's been discussion as long as I've been involved in Bitcoin. Yeah. So since 2012, there's yeah. been the discussion about we need to decentralize all the things, right? Like we need right. to have these decentralized networks and all of that. What yep. I find, and there's been all of these attempts and people are like, oh, it's so cool. It's decentralized. They just add that in. What I find so interesting is almost none of them have actually just used proof of work in the way, like, again, you're using it in the way that it was yeah. like, here's the use. Like, all of these people who have been like, we're going to decentralize. It seems like they put this idea of, de they put the cart before the horse that it's like as, and, but what I like about what you're doing, and I think your whole move is, well, you start at the foundation and, and then when you build from the found, and it sounds like almost what you're talking about there in terms of Silicon Valley is that it's like, you don't deal with like Trump is like repeal, whatever, whatever that thing is, 213 or whatever the hell that thing is. It's right, like, yeah. You don't start here. If it's gotten here, all you're doing is you're, you're just knocking off the, sim the symptoms. Yes. You, have to, you have to go to the root. And what you're saying is that the root is this religion and ideology, and it's just manifesting itself. Yeah, and it goes well, even be before that you know, to, yeah. to the system that they're in that can even, that is fertile ground for that ideology. Correct. Yeah. So the monetary system that allows this ideology to happen and then the concentrations of power. I mean, the monetary people talk, Austrians and like a lot of the, the people in cryptocurrency talk a lot about free markets and they're like, oh, you know, we live in a capitalist society, blah, blah, blah. But the markets have never been free because the currency has never been free. Right. And as long as the currency is not free, the markets are subject to distortion from the people controlling the currency and the tax rates. That's just a fact. Um, it's like right now the, the housing and stock markets are being distorted relative to the CPI because they're issuing money. It's not a free market. Like, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I guess the marketplace itself is free, but it's totally distorted in terms of its actual uh, structure because the, of, of what's happening. Um, and so, yeah, I... I, I the way simply introducing another centralized platform like Gab is not the solution, right? It's just a different perspective. You don't actually allow for a competition of ideas because whoever's in charge of that is going to use their platform to push whatever it is they believe in. If I start a platform, I'm going to push what I believe in. And that's not right either. There needs to be a genuine con uh, competition of ideas because I'm not always right. Um, and so like having a, a, a platform where it's moderated by the people speaking is totally different. It flips everything on its head. And speaking with their money work, with their work, yeah, which, with which, their which work. in this case is work, the actual, so work, work, not words, basically. Yeah. Proof yeah well, how of many work, academics would be, uh, tweeting if they had to pay for it? They wouldn't. Yeah. They wouldn't. Absolutely yep. not. Yeah. And so it's, it's the, it's the, you know, it's the upside down kingdom of communications, right? I'm hoping to create a situation where the, the last are first. Again, okay. I'm see the, the, the parallels, man. It's very, and th this is, this is when I think it starts to get, when things start to get very interesting. So, so that's a good grasp. I think that we should 
we should do this again at some point as things progress. But I know that now there's going to be some people who are watching this. I guarantee that there's going to be people who are like, I want to use this thing. So what's what stage is it at? How how can people use it? Uh, how can non-developers know what the hell is happening with this thing? What, I have what, a couple of Telegram do? chats. Um, I think if you go to stampchat.io, there's a link to the Telegram chat. If you go in there, okay. happy. I'd love to talk and answer questions. The, um, the state of the project is running on the Bitcoin ABC network right now. You could use a web version um, primarily or download the Electron desktop client. Um, I haven't pushed it very widely because I, I did a test and, and there's a few issues around transactions being dropped by one of the daemons that I have to track down and like it reports success, but the transaction didn't actually uh, get to the network. And then um, there's some issues around high availability. Like since these serve these relay servers are like essentially storing your wallet, like I need to make sure that the, those are reliable um, and that other people can run them all. Right now it's just basically my server and one one hard drive and so i'm not like wanting people to put a lot of money on there because it's uh but but to, but to at least so there is a capability to try it out but it also sounds like if there are developers who are looking for a righteous project to work on i definitely I pers- need help yeah it's i you. personally would say this is about as righteous as it comes uh to, to work on this project there's so there's one other thing i want to mention real quick please that um Stamp allows us, like, uh, uh, I don't, you're an agorist. I consider myself an anarcho-Christian. I think that they're roughly very similar in many ways. Um, and then there's anarcho-capitalists. There's all of these different anarchist groups. I don't know why we need so many different of them. I, I it, like, it doesn't make any sense to me what the <laughs> because that's the are. nature. That's the nature of our personalities. I think we want. Yeah, we but the, 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 the problem is that we can't w- really work together either in many cases. So. There, there has to be some movement where people are willing, like I'm sovereign, but I'm also going to follow this other person. But aside from that, if, if we can actually get an ideological movement around this concept of ethical money, like money that is not attached to a centralized authority, where each of us essentially are like proof of work is where all the people using the money are issuing it and they're redeeming it. Right. You were talking about being the shepherd and the sheep. Right. All money is essentially a credit. And so by choosing to use it, we're issuing it. There isn't a dude issuing Bitcoin. Right. We're we're in essence all issuing it together and we're all redeeming it by choosing to accept it for our work. Um, so if, if we can sort of develop this concept of ethical money and we can use something like stamp to bill for our attention. This puts us into the realm. I don't know if any if you've read the uh, Nassim Taleb. I think is how you pronounce skin, his name. Skin in the game. You talking about? Yeah, the author of that. But he yeah. wrote a blog post called "The Dictatorship of the Small Minority." Oh yeah, I actually just ran ran into it again yesterday or two yeah. days, three days ago. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Yeah, everybody should so, read that. Yeah, and so if we can get a messaging platform that's decentralized and on a currency that we can agree on, now guess what? You want to message me? You got to get on this network, right? And it provides a, because all of us are not believe in nonviolence, right? And so how do we yes. get, how do we, I mean, this has been the big problem that libertarians have had is that the authoritarians, they're willing to beat you on the head. And we're like, well, you want to do it or not? Fine. Our power is in, am I going to do business with you? Am I going to give you my attention? Right. And in using stamp and in using a cryptocurrency like that for billing our attention in, we bring people into our network and our way of viewing the world. And it gives us an opportunity to push out into the world and not just have like, oh, well, you got to go read human action or you got to re- go, you know, you got to go read Mrs. And then you'll understand why we do this. Right. It allows us to just be like, Oh, if you're a person that doesn't care, which most people are, right? There's essentially two or, you know, some extremist camps. Like, you know, we feel very, you know, high conviction for our beliefs about how things should be done. Um, no, most people don't care, right? That's the whole, the whole thesis of dictatorship of the small minority, right? And so if, if as agorists and, and as various, uh, you know, I don't, 
anarchy has a like a bad you know uh bad name to it even though most people just don't understand it but as right. christians if we can come together as christians and be like you want our attention you use our platform and nobody no christian no individual christian controls this platform now we have a way to push out into the world and maintain our own value yeah it's incredibly it's it's like the it's like an abstraction of let's say like the amish or mennonite principle that's underneath that's underneath right that it's like okay you're going to have to if you want to interact with us you're going to have to abide by this thing that we are being completely intolerant about like yeah completely it's intolerant kosher messenger that's exact that's exact dude that's a perfect yeah everybody should read that dictatorship of the small minority uh nicholas nassim Taleb. that's a i literally this last week i ran across it again um and and reread it and shared it to a few people so it's interesting that that, that yeah dude it's yeah, this is I, I, I it's great, Shama. Uh, I'm going to put links to this stuff in the YouTube when I put this on YouTube. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to wanted to say to uh, people? No, I mean, I, I want to talk more about credit money and, and whatnot at some point in the future, but yeah, like how all it. this relates and like, because I, I think that's really the, the the big underlying issue. But yeah, yeah, we I, I think that's a that's a that's a great discussion. Maybe we can have it in a few weeks. Um, great. I think it's these these are things people need to start thinking about. And one of the things that I like is people have been saying I'm a bit gloom and doom, but I've also said that within the next couple of weeks, I'm going to completely stop because now it's so obvious what's happening that like I don't have to do it anymore. Right. And anybody who can't see, it's just like there's nothing there's yeah. it's too late. Um, but it's also driven me to be working more and developing more and make getting back into the you know getting around other developers and that's who i want to be spending time with as people who are building so it's like i i really do consider you a brother in the struggle and in like this you know this in the spiritual warfare and you're and you're building so like i i want to say i want to say i appreciate you and i thank you you know, and I just want to tell you that in a public forum because I really do. I think your work Thank is you. super important, man. I think it's super important. So, and I appreciate yours as well, particularly uh, the the uh, the way in which you're pushing information out is something Thank that you. I just am not able to do and and, uh, and and get people interested. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, I will amplify your message and and uh, you know we'll we'll do this together. But I I know people have gotten a lot out of this. Uh, people should check this out. Developers who want to help, please do that. Um, and besides that, man, Shama, thank you as always for this conversation. It was great, enlightening, and I know that it's going to give a lot of people a, a feeling of hope, which is something that's really needed right now. So thank you, dude. Thank you.